Now on All Our FM, a special broadcast with George Matlock. Wywiad specjalny Orła FM prowadzi George Matlock. You're listening to Anglo-Polish Radio All Our FM. I'm George Matlock. Ever had to give a speech? Can be nerve-wracking if you have. Ever had to write one? That too is not without pitfalls. Ever had to write a radio script? Okay, okay, you get the idea. Our guest today is someone who didn't mince his words about the law and justice government and its predecessor in 2007 when he was Britain's ambassador to Poland. And now he's an honest broker to the highest bidder. A man who is no stranger to All FM, I'm very pleased and delighted to introduce back to uh, our airwaves Charles Crawford. Witamy serdecznie. How are you? Hi, very well, thank you. It's nice <laughs> to be back on the, on the show. Well, it's great to have you back. Now, Charles, um, I know uh, you have been busy as a consultant to governments recently and have a new book all about speech writing and delivery. Um, but I'd like to begin, if I may, by asking you, with Brexit, the referendum on whether Britain should stay or leave the European Union in the headlines, if you were asked to draft a speech for the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, what would it contain? Well, you, <laughs> this is a very big question, and it's all about the relationship between the speechwriter and the, and the speaker. I mean, mm. basically, it would contain what he wants, and the, the, issue, the issue I would ask him, if, if he was sitting here with me, and I, he was saying, look, I want you to come up with a really good speech about this, I'd say, right, what are your basic messages? And I'd say, what is it you want the audience to remember? What is it you want them to understand? What is it you want them to feel? Mm. Um, and once you get those big things right, and then I'd ask questions about who's the audience on the day. Are we talking about, you know, a British audience or an international audience? Are we talking about an after-dinner speech? Or are we talking about a set-piece massive production that, uh, like the one that he did at Reuters and so on? You know, what's mm. going on? And I think the way I look at it is to get the context of it right, the very big picture of it right, the sense of, um, the, sense of the tone, actually. What's the tone? Is it meant to be... Is he meant to be sounding wise? Is he meant to be sounding urgent? Is he meant to be sounding powerful? Is he went, meant to be sounding reflective? Get all those things right. The words are actually quite easy. Mm. So it's really all about knowing who your audience is. Well, it's about knowing who the audience is, but it's about having the conversation between the speaker and the audience. Is, you know, are there things the audience want to hear? Are there things the audience don't want to hear? Are there things the audience don't want to hear that you need to tell them? Mm. And so these are, these, I mean, I'm sitting here actually in my, uh, in my house here looking at the slides I'm doing for a, a presentation, a webinar with the United Nations. All those things are on these slides in front of me as it happens. Mm. Because they're really all about the relationship between the speaker, the event, the occasion, the words, the audience on the day, the audience on the internet, the audience in Poland. You know, there's an awful lot going on in a speech, especially a major speech for a, you know, a really quite dramatic policy issue like this one. Mm. I've occasionally had to give speeches and um, I've got, had to get in front of uh, bankers and other uh, audiences, uh, very many of which are, you know, obviously very numerical, um, astute. Um, I've had to give, uh, you know, survey uh, res uh, results out, uh, which are, can be quite dry and boring on their own. One of the things I've always found works for me is a touch of humour. Um, it tends to wake them up at least. So they do hear about the percentiles and quartiles. Um, is humour something that you think is an important element in giving a speech? Well, the, the big message I give to people is if you're giving a speech, don't be boring. And there are lots of different ways of not being boring, but being boring is a very good way of being boring. So humour is, is an important part. That doesn't, people think, oh, goodness, but I'm not very good at telling jokes. It's not about telling jokes. Mm. It's about playing with issues of surprise. So surprise comes in different mm. forms. Look, I'm here to talk about banking figures today. There's going to be an awful lot of numbers. But let me first start by talking about cheese. And then you mm. basically, then everyone smiles and you get them interested in why you're talking about cheese and you link, you know, the cheese you had this morning to the overdraft problem you've got. And somehow all of a sudden you get into it and they're just engaged. So I think humor uh, comes in different shapes and sizes. But a lot of really what is good humor in a, in, a, in a speech is simply surprise, playing with their expectations, working out what it is they want, and then doing something different. Okay, well, that's very good and wise uh, comment there for anyone who's a budding uh, script or speech writer. Now, very often a band on stage will try to converse with the audience. Does that work in the arena of speeches? Well, of course it does, because the whole point of a speech is that it's, 
it's not meant to be a lecture. It's not meant to be a, someone reading out a telephone directory. It's meant to be a conversation between the speaker and the audience. And the more the speaker, and for that matter, the speechwriter together can come up with that sense of conversation, spontaneity, surprise, and so on, the better the audience will, I think, um, enjoy the speech. Okay, so uh, that does work. And um, uh, is that something that you, uh, you encourage in and use it very much when you're advising your clients? Yes, absolutely, because what you're looking for is for the audience to like the client. I mean, what the, this is, the, if you like, the, uh, the theme of my book. The only result of any speech by anybody anywhere is that the audience should say, mm, that was good, more please. Either I'll vote for that person, I want to go and hear them again at the next conference, let's get them on the headhunter list. That's the effect you're trying to achieve, and you best do that by giving a sense to people in the audience that you're talking to them naturally and, you know, honestly. And if you can uh, accomplish that, that's fine. If you don't accomplish that, they'll go away feeling, you know, disgruntled, unhappy, not wanting to see you again. One of the things that I found, particularly when you're dealing with dry content, very often survey results and things of that sort, where lots of percentiles, quartiles and so on, is that uh, it helps to use humour, but also um, it helps to use bullet points. Um, now, uh, one of the, in that case, you know, uh, I find it, it a lot easier because you don't then have to keep, di- you know, religiously to a script. But of course, a lot of officials find that a bit frightening, don't they, with the sort of political correctness that we live in and the, and the worry about their career if they go off off tangent and say something they shouldn't. Is that something that do you think prevents people from being better speakers? Well, there's different points there. One is how far you want a speech to convey information. I don't know about you and your listeners, but I find it quite hard to remember anything at the end of the weather forecast anyone said you know you you say you've t- they've talked for two minutes but is it going to rain so i think speeches are bad at conveying information so what they're very good at is conveying wisdom and conveying a mood mm. so you know rather than give people large lists of numbers you can hand out the numbers say look here they are on a piece of paper this is what they mean now the separate separate question is how do you then you know, achieve some sort of spontaneity. Clearly, the more a speech is written down and you're reading it out, your eyes are stuck on the text. The eyes aren't engaging with the audience. Uh, But there are speeches, clearly those given by, you know, world leaders at the UN, where every word they say Mm. has been carefully chosen. And so, in a sense, they don't want to stray too far off the script. Though even there, when people do uh, stray off the script for one reason or another, either because they get it wrong or because they suddenly realize they want to say something different, that's normally the powerful bit of the speech that people remember. So the more spontaneous and conversational you can make these things, obviously the better. And if that means drafting it in extended note form, that's really the best way to do it, I think. Now, the irony is, you mentioned they're world leaders and, and where, where the media and, and everyone around them are sort of hanging on their every word. And, and yet... Um, if you think about it, there are different kinds of speakers in the sense that um, you've got a policymaker who, whose, whose comments, whose wisdom and, and mood will be important. So, you know, a speech by somebody like uh, Nelson Mandela would be something that everybody wanted to hear and wanted to sort of gauge what he was trying to say. On the other hand, you've then got, let's say, an economist or a, 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 an asset manager or somebody like that who gets on stage, and they're in a slightly different situation because, quite honestly, all the bankers or their fraternity who are sitting in the audience um, probably already know um, a little bit about their wisdom. Uh, they certainly know a lot about their mood and probably don't care too much for their mood. They want the facts. They, they actually want somebody to say, well, tell us something we don't know. So, tell us something that we aren't telling our clients back home. Well, sure, and of course, each speech is different, and each speech has a different context. I'm sure there are professional occasions where professional people want to hear professional nitty-gritty, though even there, to be honest, I, I wonder myself how long after the speech they actually remember specific details, unless the speech has gone out of its way to emphasize those details. Mm. It all depends, really, what the speaker's trying to achieve. If you, you know, it's a bit like a painting, you know, you, you get an impressionist painting, or you get very detailed mm. paintings which are you know, from the Renaissance period or something, where every tiny wrinkle in the cloth is, is, is there standing out. So you, it just depends. You know, pick the tool for the job is what I always say. No, I started off by asking you about uh, a, a speech written for David Cameron. Mm. Um, so are you in favour of Britain leaving uh, the European Union, the Brexit? Well, I'm certainly in favour of the referendum. And as things stand as of this afternoon, I'm inclined towards voting in favour of Brexit, partly as a partly as a, or 
perhaps even mainly as a sort of protest vote against the state of the world as much as anything else. Mm. I think the difficulty with all this is clearly there are huge strategic consequences one way or the other. Or maybe not. You know, maybe in fact it would be better for the EU if if the UK was 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 semi detached, you know, in a much more formal way. And that wouldn't stop us contributing to EU programmes, working closely with EU partners on lots of things, but it would take away a lot of aggravation and part of me also thinks that in fact there are lots of things you know the eu in a way is a prisoner of his own success if i can put it that way there's maybe just too much and the the forces of integration are eroding uh, nation state parliaments nation state sovereignty and so on and and perhaps the only way to to stop that is for one country to say no Mm. Now, Norway, Switzerland, interesting examples, uh, both, uh, you know, uh, in the past EFTA members, as indeed was Britain until 1972. Uh, Both of these countries, however, are in the EEA, the European Economic uh, Area. And um, there there is a sort of feeling that that by not being members of the European Union, they're still very often footing the bill for a lot of the consequences in the EU, but don't don't actually have a vote in the Parliament. Is that something that you're, you're comfortable with? Sure, why not? I mean, I don't think it matters if we contribute to EU uh, processes. In fact, I think if I was advising someone, you know, senior in the Brexit campaign, I would say, look, after we leave the EU, we should continue to work very closely with all sorts of EU programs, including perhaps, you know, the the stabilization funds or whatever they're called these Mm -hmm. days for, for Central and Eastern Europe. There's no reason why you shouldn't do that. Um, but you can, you can do it on a different basis. You know, you would lose you you would end up having to contribute to various processes and you would end up not having a say in them. On the other hand, you would have a, your own national say in lots of other things, which at the moment you don't have, including trade policy. You know, at the moment, the, one of the whole pillars of the EU is that the EU negotiates trade agreements at the world level on behalf of every every mm. member. We would start having our own say in that process, and as a huge trading nation, I think that would probably mm. be quite a good thing even if it would be a bit disruptive in the short term. Um, now, you, you mentioned Central and Eastern Europe. Now, of course, out there there has been a, a new debate uh, opened up because of the British stance with the referendum, and, and indeed some people are calling for a referendum of the same type in Poland. Would you be in favour of Poland sort of exiting uh, the European Union, a, a kind of poxit? You know, there you are, there's a new hashtag for you, poxit. Well, it's not for me to say whether I would or not. I, I don't think it would be a good idea if everyone started leaving. Uh, though, of course, that's one of the risks. The question, the question is whether they should have uh, so much uh, a referendum, uh, whether it's something that, that you know we should be keeping politicians on their toes about on a regular uh, seasonal basis, as opposed to this kind of, well, you've, you've now signed up for the EU, so de facto you've signed up for the Eurozone at some point in the future, which is kind of where they, they stand at the moment. But is it something they should be allowing themselves to, to refresh and do, it, you know, do a rain check and, and maybe ultimately leave or maybe, maybe not leave? Well, sure. I mean, it's up to each country to decide what it's comfortable with. I mean, I, I have the impression that Poles as a nation are right high up there in terms of satisfaction with the EU, but I suspect also, and I've always thought this since I was there in the early 2000s, that Poland would be not rushing to join the Eurozone, because I think Poland feels, well, hang on a minute, you know, it's taken us several decades to get our own free currency back, and we'd like to keep it for a bit longer, thanks. So, you know, the referenda are fine, but, you know, the especially with the way social media work these days, you can get an awful lot of populism creeping into these things. And it's one thing, things being legitimate. It's another thing, things getting more extreme. And if you look around the world, you can see populism here, there, and everywhere popping up, as it were, in in pretty unsatisfactory ways. Uh, so I think that's... Um, I mean, I've got a great theory of politics, really, which is that either the the center holds and the extremes stay more or less where they are at the extremes, or the extremes expand and start to squeeze out the middle. And I think you look around the world, you can see quite a lot of evidence that different forms of extremism, whether it's, you know, Russian nationalism or Islamism or Trumpism or whatever you want to call it, are putting a real squeeze on the center. Mm. And uh, social media helps that, various things help it. Referenda are fine, except you may end up getting more of that. And is that really what you want? Now, certainly with the Scottish referendum a couple of uh, years ago, uh, we, I, I certainly felt that we had not a particularly mature debate um, about the issues for and against. Uh, and in the end, it was the fear factor and, and the better the devil you know, which was the cliche that won the day. Um, obviously, a lot of that supported by social media and, and the loudest soundbite of them all, uh, which tends to prevail. Is that your concern about the way 
that the Brexit debate over the next few months might might unravel. Oh, I, I, well, as a concern, it's an absolute fact that, that that is exactly how it's going to unravel. If you look at the Prime Minister's British Prime Minister's statements, he's already using words like fear, risk, you know, concern. He's trying to paint the outside as something very black, and you look at. Then on the other hand, you look in the, the Times and say, if we leave the EU, it's not a leap into the dark, it's a leap into the light. So different sides are going to be trying to do what you call in speech writing terms, framing the other side. You either, you're framing the other side as, as nutty or extreme or dangerous, mm. whereas we are safe, steady as she goes. Basically in politics, in democratic politics, there are two choices, steady as she goes or it's time for a change. In the EU case, I think the, the language of... Uh, risk has been very much on the side of staying in. It's very risky to leave. And look at the pound today. The pound's gone down. They'll be saying, ha-ha, we told you so. Look, it's risky to even talk about this. But I think with migration, eurozone, low growth, demographics, and so on and so on, the argument that it's risky to stay is a lot more credible now than it probably was five years ago. So people will be trying to definitely use emotion and scare tactics, if you want to put it that way, to try to frame the issues in the way that suits them. That's absolutely what's going to happen. Now, I want to turn back to your book itself. Now, uh, this was pu- uh, published last year, and I know it's been since updated. Speeches for Leaders Leave Audiences Wanting More. That's the name of the book. It has found favour already among a number of Labour Foreign Secretaries, David Owen, Jack Straw to name two, and is available in Europe as an e-book and also hardback in the USA. Any other ways to obtain it? Well, you can get it hard back from me. I'm, I'm sitting here with uh, a pile of them here in the house. So anyone who wants an autographed copy from me uh, can just contact me through my website and I'll quickly send it to them. So right. that's the best way to get a hard copy. But at the moment, in outside North America, that's the only way you can do it. But you can certainly get it as an e-book on Kindle or whatever. And uh, can you tell us what is the website? Yeah, charlescrawford.biz charlescrawford.biz okay. You'll find me easily enough, yeah. Brilliant. Um, now, you mentioned uh, in the book that former Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski, um, he made a speech in Berlin back in November 2011. Um, he described it as a, as a kind of a defining and perhaps his best ever speech. How I know you, you've proofread that, that speech, um, but it did go a little bit off script, didn't it? Um, so what was so special about the speech? Was it the honesty? That alone would be a first for a politician. I think quite a lot of politicians are honest in one way or the other. They don't necessarily always say everything they you know, have to say. That's a slightly different question. I think that speech stood out because it had some lines which were very, very striking. And it's very rare to get a speech by a, you know, a European foreign minister, or indeed any foreign minister, quoted in every major newspaper of the world. And this speech was quoted around the world. And one of the, the key line was something to the effect of, I demand of Germany that they take the action required to, you know, prop up the Eurozone. Mm. And he went on to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, this may be strange for a Polish foreign minister to say, but I fear German inactivity uh, more than I fear German tanks, or some sort of language like that. Now, that is very, very personal language. He didn't Mm. say Poland demands of Germany, or Europe demands of Germany, or the situation demands of Germany. It's I demand of Germany, and there's the sort of image of Sikorsky standing there demanding of Germany in Berlin. Yeah. This is very, very powerful uh, language, and he wrote that himself. I know for a fact he wrote that himself, and he then had to decide, does he want to give that speech with that element of risk? And he did, and I think there's some of the great speeches are precisely those where you, you hear the speaker saying, listen, this is what I believe, I'm putting my reputation on the line, take it or leave it. And that's very powerful when people genuinely do that. And I think it, you may not like it, but you can certainly respect it. Now, finally, we, we like to name drop on ORFM, so I want to ask you, can you uh, list the names of a few people for whom you have written speeches? Well, I've helped with speeches with Mr. Sikorsky. I've helped with, uh, I've helped with speeches with John Soares, uh, head of MI6. When I was in the Foreign Office, I wrote for different Prime Ministers. I've contributed to the Queen and so on. So I've had a huge... Um, experience in writing official speeches and also some, you know, helping people with some business speeches and interview preparation. It's all, it's all the same thing. It's all how you come across to people on the day, whether it's a small audience or a, or a huge audience. But certainly the the big political speeches and the and the, the ones I've done for John Soares, who was actually when he was MI6, I helped him with one of his speeches. He's given two very well received speeches since he 
step down as head of MI6 about the state of the world and technology. I think that, I think they read well. I mean, they're interesting and they're they're powerful. And I, when I'm helping speakers, I always try to focus on content. You know, there's no point in in looking right and sounding right if you've got nothing really interesting to say. You know, what is it about where you are that's interesting? Yeah. And how do we t- take that material and make it accessible to people? Did you coin any phrases or come up with any any sort of catchphrases that that, that that have gone on to be used by policymakers? Well, not really, but uh, <laughs> the um, <laughs> going right back in the day when I was writing for Jeffrey Howe, he, he wanted to write a speech about Europe's food problems. In those days, some of us are old enough to remember there were ma- mountains of butter and wine lakes mm. and all this sort of yeah. stuff because of a common agricultural policy leading to insane quantities of stockpiling. So he, he in his speech, he wrote a speech about this. I wrote it for him. And he, he, he basically said, look, this is ridiculous. We're arming ourselves against the Soviet Union. This is back in the Cold War. And yet we're giving them subsidized butter. And I thought, why don't we call that the diet of détente? Because détente was then the expression of moving closer to the Soviet Union. He crossed that out, and he said, look, that diet of détente doesn't make any sense. I said, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but it sounds good. And he said, no, 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 I can't put that in. Anyway, so I did the next version of the speech, and I put it back in. He crossed it out. I put it back in. He left it in the final version. That was the line that was quoted in the newspapers because it was mm. something that somehow seemed to sum up the problem. And sometimes these things aren't all about the literal meaning of words. It's about, it's about how they come across and how they resonate with people, and you've got to be good at that as well. So was, was it a bit of, it sounds a bit like a tug of war, you putting it in, him taking it, taking him out, taking it out, you putting it back in. I mean, what, was it that he simply overlooked it at the end and just read it out, or did he just give up trying to... I think he sort of gave up. I think he's maybe, I mean, you know, I was a young diplomat then, and he was, uh, you know, a distinguished foreign secretary, but he's a very nice man, and he was very, you know, he was open to persuasion, that was the point. He wasn't someone who would get cross if you put it back in. You know, we used to talk about these things and chat about it. I said, look, you know, just go with me on this one, it worked. And one of the other people I, I'll just give you another quick example. One of the other speeches I did, in fact, it was the one for John Soares, I'll tell you this. He, wa- he was giving a speech at King's College London, and... He wanted to open with his experiences of his father, who'd come to King's College London after the war as a very young officer with shell shock, post-traumatic stress, or whatever you call it these days. And, I, and he said, we wanted to start with that. I said, why don't you finish with that instead? Because that's a very nice, personal, unexpected note to finish on. And he did, and it really worked on the day. So, mm. so some of these things are about words, and sometimes they're about just capturing the mood. And I think the yes. good speechwriter works with the speaker to just explore with them ideas on how you do that and how they temper their own boldness and willingness to take chances and uh, that I think is where to be honest Mr. Sikorsky has been very strong he has taken some chances and I think you know on occasion I've helped him with the language of that. Fantastic that's something definitely to be proud of and um, you mentioned the head of state the Queen Her Majesty the Queen Um, was it the Queen's speech you worked on? No, no, no. For, the, for the, when the Queen, um, you know, if, if the Queen is coming to Poland or if the, the mm. state visit of the President of Poland to, to London, there'll be a speech at the state banquet and they'll clearly run that past, you know, the ambassador and so on to give some ideas. So I've contributed on different times of my career to those sorts of speeches. The Queen's speech opening Parliament is, is rather more ritualistic. You have phrases put in from all around Whitehall. So it's less personal, in a way, less interesting, I think, than a speech on a, you know, on a dinner where it's meant to be a very warm occasion and you want to get the right balance between, between not making any policy points, because that's not the Queen's job, but you've also got to set the tone in a way which is very uh, warm and wise. So they're quite challenging speeches, actually, speeches for the for the royal family for those sorts of reasons. Well, I, I certainly hope that uh, the interview will be a major inspiration as well to budding speech writers. And uh, you know where you can buy the book. You heard it from Charles Crawford.biz. And uh, I, I'm just delighted to have you back on the show. So thank you very much for all your time, Charles. And I look forward to the next time.